I'm thankful that you're here and uh, looking forward to our time together. This is a three-part class. I realized uh, from my many years of coming to this lectureship that sometimes I'll try to figure out how to hear one out of three and uh, try to piece them together and then buy the, the uh, uh, DVDs or whatever. So what I'd ask you to do, I'm thankful that you're here today, and if you're looking ahead, I want to give you a brief uh, uh, intro to what we're going to be doing. First of all, I want to know who you are in this class, all right? So the first thing I want to ask you is, how many of you have family members who grew up in churches of Christ and are no longer active in churches of Christ? Raise your hand, okay, because I just want to get a feel for who we are. Okay, how many of you have had uh, uh, leadership roles in your church like teaching Sunday school, teaching children's classes, leading a ministry, something like that in your church where you've tried to coordinate. Okay, so part of what I want to do is I actually, I recognize that what I'm about to do, if I was sitting in your seat, would start out sounding like it wasn't very hopeful. So I'm going to get through that as quickly as I can. But I do want to introduce this because uh, my wife is a five-generation uh, uh, a descendant in Churches of Christ. And uh, in my family, uh, my dad uh, took us to Churches of Christ in between my seventh and eighth grade year of school. Okay? And so we bring a little different perspective. And my guess is, is that some of you in here kind of lean towards Susan's side, and then some of you might lean a little bit toward my experience. But what I recognized is we're both really invested in this thing. The church that has had the most influence in my life is the Church of Christ. It's had the most influence in my life. Uh, I've gone to a multiplicity of different churches. My mom was a vacation Bible school junkie when we were children. I actually asked her about that. I said, how did we start going to church? I was a vacation Bible school junkie. If the Nazarenes, the Methodists, the Baptists, whoever had them, I was taking you kids. And I do remember this. I can remember this. In fact, the first Church of Christ vacation Bible school we ever went to was in Everett, Washington. We grew up in Portland, but my dad had a job in Everett. We were staying in a little extended stay place then. And my mom took us to vacation Bible school. And she reminded me, she said, and we liked that one. Uh, and so I can kind of remember that one. I remember the Southgate Christian Church in Portland, Oregon, and us going to vacation Bible school there. But the church that's had the most influence on my life is the Church of Christ. Here's part of the reason. When I was in high school, uh, my dad went to a Christian workshop in Portland. Many of you will remember the Great Northwest Evangelism Workshop at that time. My dad took, uh, went to that. And at that workshop, one of the speakers was Dr. Jerry Jones, who at the time was the head of the Bible department at Harding University. My dad asked me if I would be willing to go to uh, a Christian school in Arkansas. Of course, you gotta bear in mind, I didn't know what that was. We knew about Pepperdine, but I didn't know the connection between Pepperdine and Churches of Christ. You follow what I'm saying? We lived on the West Coast, so we knew about Pepperdine, but it's a different relationship you learn about later. And the same thing was true with Harding. So I get in my 1968 Chevelle and uh, drove to Boise, Idaho, and they'd worked it out for me to stay with a Christian family in Boise, Idaho. Then we drove the next day somewhere to Kansas. I can't remember the name of the town and stayed with a Christian family there. And then uh, next day we ended up at Harding University uh, close to the middle of the night. I drove in, met Jerry Jones there. He took me over to his house. You remember his wife at that time, Claudette? They took me in. She kind of became a mother figure to me. And uh, that's how it all got started. Well, a few weeks into being at Harding, I met a guy named Byron Fike on campus. Byron was a little older than me. He started uh, sharing the gospel with me through his life. Then when he found out that Jesus and I had not kind of really got to know each other, he went to work on that. And then my third semester at Harding, November 17th, 1981, I was baptized into Christ. Well, Byron was preaching at a little church called Griffithville, a little town called Griffithville, Arkansas. And so uh, Byron and Liz were married. They took Susan and I, this is my wife Susan over here, they took us out there. And uh, Byron uh, 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 felt like that I should give my testimony. So I got up one night, gave him a testimony. Then a couple of weeks later, felt like I should preach. Some of you know the story. That's where I meant to say shoot in a sermon and... Ah, do you agree? <laughs> so, you know, it's all happened in Churches of Christ for me. And, uh, but 
what was happening was, and this is kind of fascinating, is that, and I want you to hear this because this is the most important thing I'm going to say today. I was coming to the church through Jesus. See, I was getting to know him. And as a result of getting to know him, then what Jesus does is he starts introducing you to his family, right? So you're talking to him and the next thing you know, he takes you to part of his family in one place and then he takes you to part of his family in another place. And you start getting to know him and you start seeing family resemblance, right? Because what you start seeing is qualities of him, the oldest brother, right? You start seeing that in all the siblings. And uh, of course, then, though, on thankfully in Scripture, there's a photo album of the early members of our family. And that's very helpful because we have characteristics like them, too. Right. So we act like Peter. Sometimes we act like the Corinthians. We've even probably met a few Ananias and Sapphira's along the way. Right. So what we realize is, is that first photo album is extremely helpful because it helps us see that he's been working through people like us all the way along. It's never quite worked out exactly like, you know, you, a utopian mindset you could come up with. I, I love it when people, and I, I've heard professors talk about this, are you sure you want to be the first century church because you'd have to choose fairly well between maybe the Thessalonians and Philippians and maybe the Corinthians and which one do you want to be? That's not really the point, is it? What that first photo album does for us, this thing we call the Bible, is it says that Jesus chose to work with people. And what happens is, when we start coming to Him through the church, we've actually reversed the flow. And the church takes on a different texture, the way we look at it. When we start with the church and kind of backtrack up toward Jesus, you say, now this is why I had you raise your hands. You say, well, what was I going to do about that? I was born in it. Right? A guy at our church joked one time, he said, I have been going to the church of Christ since I was in my great grandmother's womb. <laughs> what was I going to do about that? You know, right? I started in it. And it was the church that I got to know before I got to know Jesus. Now, how many of you can kind of relate to that? So part of, and I loved what Josh uh, said last night, part of the wisdom and maturity of growing as a disciple is figuring out at what point I would make that right that I would actually move into the place. Now, you all know we have a vocabulary that works with college students. We say to them, you're going to go find your own faith. See, we have a vocabulary for them. But my guess is that it's probably a vocabulary we would all benefit from, is that at some point I would think, wow, I wonder how much of Jesus I really know. I wonder if the church has photoshopped him. So that when I look at the picture album, the Bible, I'm actually seeing him cropped, shadowed, touched up. So that I'm, I'm, I might have to actually go back and see if I can find some original images of him. Now, here is the struggle that I would also like to dovetail into what we'll do for three days. We have all noticed that if we would give it, if we take the calculations of current trends in church in the United States, current trends in churches of Christ, that we've got about three decades to go in this movement before we are almost irrelevant in American culture. You say, well, how would you pick three decades? Well, I've been working on this for months, so I can't tell you all of it, but I, here's how I've worked it out. If you look at the number of churches of Christ that are closing each year, you look at the decline of membership, you look at the median age 
of the bulk of our churches, then what I'm doing is I'm calculating the age of churches, the outflow of our young people, how many actually come back after college, how many families, young families stay with the church, how many young families leave the church. You know, and I'm calculating all of that. So I've got about three de decades. That doesn't mean we won't be here. It just means that how we know it right now, we won't be here. OK, now, how many of you are sitting here right now and thinking to yourself, even if I stayed fairly healthy, I won't be here in three decades. <laughs> now, you understand that if the bulk of our churches are the, less than five percent of our churches are over 500 members. Less than five percent. Over 80 percent of our churches are 75 members and less, which is not bad. That's like not a bad, you understand, that's, that's not a bad statistic. But those churches age is where the scary part steps in. Because if you take that 75% of our churches, 75 and under, and then you take the median age of those churches, that's where the calculations begin to say, whoa, whoa, hold on, what, what, what are we doing here? Okay, so I don't want you to think, oh, that was kind of discouraging, no. I think it's good to have a few data points so then we could ask ourselves, I wonder if there's a connection between looking at Jesus through the lens of the church and the fact that the church begins to lose relevance in society. Because I know for myself that when I think about the church being more relevant, and I, I'm just going to start with this confession because I've got to get where you are and you've got to get where I am. I almost always start with what does the church need to do? What do we need to do differently? Can any of you join me in that confession? Seriously. Do you feel it as well? OK, I, that's where I'm coming from. And you know what I started realizing? That's part of the faulty DNA that's now in me is that I would think that we would have to reshape the church for it to be relevant rather than making a more significant shift, which is to go back and refresh how I understand Jesus and start going through Jesus to see what to do in the church. It's a very important, significant shift. So what we're going to do today, which I think will be fun, is uh, we're going to look at this through the lens of Mark chapter 2. I hope you've got your Bibles with you. And uh, I, I think this is a fantastic story of Jesus. So let's dive in. Okay. So a few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Real quickly, for those of you uh, that have been studying the Bible for a while, help us out. What does it mean that he came home to Capernaum? Someone tell, what, what does that mean? Coming home. Thank you. Home base, because we know he's born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. So that gets a little confusing. But where Capernaum is located on the Sea of Galilee, it's a little bit more centrally located for ministry. Most of you know than where Nazareth would be. Right. So that's what it means. Home base. So he comes home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And you remember in chapter one, when he goes to the synagogue and he had that first confrontation with a demon. And that kind of gets things stirred up. And then remember, he goes to Peter's house and helps his mom uh, get Peter mother-in-law get well so she can help serve. And then the whole town shows up outside. And then the next morning, Jesus slips away to pray. And the disciples are like, hey, listen, we've got pandemonium over there. Everybody wants to know where you are. Jesus says, well, we actually need to go out and preach. What does this verse say? He ends up doing both. He's preaching and he's healing. He's preaching and he's healing. Stirring up a big crowd. Notice what happens next. So some men come bringing him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Well, since they couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the mat the, the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there and they're thinking to themselves, hey, wait a second. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. So he said to them, why are you thinking these things? And which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, uh, take up your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to them, to the man, 
I tell you to get up, take your mat and go home. So he got up, he took his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. They praised God saying and everybody out loud together. We have never seen anything like this. Now, I want to focus on that phrase. We've never seen anything like this. We've never seen anything like this. Now, you can do this on your own right now if you want to. It doesn't bother me. But you, if you want, if you got your smartphone or whatever you want, you want to Google this phrase. We've never seen anything like this. Here's what will happen. One of the first things that will come up is actually Mark chapter 2, which I think is fascinating. OK, but here's another thing that comes up. The Aaron Hernandez trial. How many of you kind of followed that a little bit? OK, well, Dan Wetzel, who's a, a, a sports a writer for Yahoo Sports International, he made this comment. He said, here we got a guy that's just a few months out from catching a touchdown of Super Bowl. He is uh, just a few weeks out from signing a multimillion dollar contract. And then he allegedly kills two people. And then he murders a guy. And, and, and Dan Wetzel says, we've Never seen anything like this. But if you stay on that same Google page, you meet this girl. <laughs> yep, that's the girl. And as is true on any video like this, they say it's the bunny stampede and we've never seen anything like this. Now, I delete every single one of those notices because all of those videos say we've never seen anything like this. But isn't it fascinating that in both situations, whether it's extremely serious or kind of goofy, people use the phrase what? Weave? Right. So what I'd like you to think about is that sometimes when people use that phrase, it's been an emotional experience. Never seen anything like this. When some people use the phrase, it's a data point experience. Ooh. Never seen anything like that. So you might be a medical researcher. And they're imagining that this disease functions this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And then somebody finds out that if you inject someone with the polio virus, that it affects certain kinds of cancer. And then what does someone say? Whoa, never seen anything like that. Well, that's different than the bunny stampede. Would you not agree? Now, I want us to look at this text a little more seriously. I've abbreviated it for us to remember it. We've never seen anything like this. So let's look at it. Who is the weave? The neighborhood. It's the neighborhood. Never see, never. This means memorable impact. These people are not cataloging their entire life, no matter how old they've lived, and compared notes and says, well, now, wait a minute. You know, that, that one funeral we went to, that was a really weird one. No, they're talking about memorable impact. Remember when Maya Angelou said people will forget what you do, they'll forget what you say, but they will remember how you made them feel. Right. OK, scene. Tangible experience. This is something that I will not forget because it did actually happen. And then the anything like this is compared to what we're used to, this stands apart. So my question is, what made the impact and what stood apart? Well, how about if we reverse it and ask, what are they used to? What are they used to? What are the people used to when religious leaders start grumbling in their culture? What are they used to? Well, things shut down and people shut up. Isn't that what they're used to? How do you fight that level of religious control? You remember Jesus said, you know, you Pharisees, the biggest issue with you guys is that you stack up burdens all over people and won't lift one finger to help. them. So the people you're already leading won't trust you, but you'll travel over land and see and make a new convert and then turn them into uh, twice the son of hell as you are. But you got to keep getting people that don't know you because the people that already know you know your script. They can actually say it before you say it. So when the Pharisees say something around a Zacchaeus guy like, 
What in the world are you doing going to the house of a sinner? Everybody knows, oh, I probably ought not to go to the house of a sinner then. What are you doing over there eating with a Matthew guy? Oh, well, I wasn't actually meeting with a Matthew guy. I, uh... And isn't that actually in our picture album later on in Galatians where Paul says, yeah, we were at a church picnic and, uh, and uh, Peter was there. And then the guys from Jerusalem showed up and Peter got up and says, hey, listen, I'm out. I've, got, I've got to go. And Paul says, no, no, you're actually not going this time. No, you're actually not going to walk away this time. Because the gospel doesn't let you walk away this time. What are people used to? No, I, I'm probably out of go. I... You see, the people know the script. They know what happens when these religious leaders weigh in. They know the outcome. They've seen it a thousand times. You can't beat the man. But Jesus is different. You say, no, that's, that's not what I think it is. I think it was the miracle. I think it was the miracle. Well, you do realize this isn't the first miracle. You know that, right? You do know that, right? Because where was the water to wine miracle? Well, just down the street in Cana. And what happened at Peter's house? Well, that's where the whole crowd was in chapter 1. And it's in the same area. This isn't the first miracle. Now, maybe it's the first time they've seen a lame guy get up and walk. And I'll absolutely give us that. But you realize it's something more than the lame guy gets up and walks. It's not just what Jesus does. It's how Jesus does it. So... Before we turn the, this part of the photo album, let's stop and think about a part of the picture that, I, that might already be rumbling around in some of your minds. This whole forgive your sins thing before you heal them. You remember that? Now, you remember a place where he reversed that? At the pool of Bethesda, right. So remember, there he healed the lame, lame guy, but then he found him later in the temple. And remember what he said to him? Yeah, you need to quit your sinning or something worse will happen. I was speaking at a youth rally in uh, Nashville, and I asked the question, what could be worse than being lame for 38 years? And some teenager yelled out, being lame for 39, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you know, Jesus did have a point with that guy, didn't he? So let's actually take a moment and think about that. You see, the guy in, in, in John 5, it appears as though he was so focused on his illness that he judged all of life through the illness. And he made decisions on what was acceptable and unacceptable in his own spirit. What was sin and what wasn't sin. What was serious, egregious sin and what was sin that you could just pass off. What was culturally acceptable sin and what was not culturally acceptable sin. What was moral failure and what was moral mistake. He'd made all those decisions in his spirit, wrapping it around his disease. Jesus stepped in and said, you realize your disease is not the center of your life. God is the center of your life. And now that you have been made well physically, you still are going to have to step back and figure out how to recenter yourself in God. With this man in Mark 2, he just starts that way. Hey, fella, let's get you right with God. Let's center you in God. Could the church be on this same page of the photo album where we become so centered on our disease that we make most of our decisions based in the disease? You do realize that if you don't love others, it's a moral failure. You do realize that of the six things God hates, yea, seven, that if you lie about other people, that makes his list of perfect hates. Have you noticed that in our churches, we look at the outside world 
and we think, well, we'd never be able to interact with them. They're too diseased. In fact, about the only way we could keep our church healthy is to keep them out. But now we're like these men who don't realize how diseased we've become. I wondered why my dad loved the church so much. He couldn't find a perfect one. I finally figured out he wasn't looking for a perfect one because he found the perfect Jesus. So who needs a perfect church if you find a perfect Jesus? If you've got the eldest brother that's perfect, then the rest of the assemblies don't have to be perfect. What I found fascinating with him is of all, and I'm not going to catalog them, but of all the unbelievable things that he endured through the course of his life in the church, he just kept thinking about how much Jesus loved the church. And he just kept thinking that Jesus was the one he was following when he interacted with the church. Well, that spilled over in how he saw people on the outside. At his funeral, people stood up and spoke. Many of them people we'd never met. Some older lady that had a fruit stand on the side of the road, found out my dad had died, came to the funeral, stood up and she made the comment. She said, I'm not actually sure he ever needed the fruit he bought. But it's He'd spend a few hours listening to me. They lived in a tiny little town where the local library sent a, a truck out once a week to deliver books. The librarian who was trying to raise two kids on her own as a single mom said, you know, he was always the first one there. I'm not sure he needed a librarian. He always ordered his books in advance. But he'd sit and listen to a mom who was struggling to raise her children. I found it fascinating that my dad didn't have to kind of get in there and figure out what blew up her marriage and, and who was right and who was wrong and who wounded whom. I think he just figured out that if we focus on the disease, we'll just get more diseased. But I wonder what it would be like if we started with, hey, we've met our perfect older brother and it turns out he wants us in the photo album. You thought your picture would be cut out of the album. He actually wants to feature you. See, I have a feeling that what they weren't used to was the way that Jesus treated the people. There is a direct correlation between a church clinging to, we've never done it that way, and a neighborhood waiting to say, we've never seen anything like this. You see, what I've realized in my own outreach is the reason that I appear irrelevant to the world is not because my older perfect brother is irrelevant. What Jesus has to say was relevant to me in 1980 and 81 and led me to Christ. It's still relevant to everything I'm going through right now. I can't find a smarter older brother other than Jesus. I can't find a more loving one, a more consistent one. I can't find that knows more what to do with my life than my older brother Jesus. So he's not irrelevant. But the problem is the world thinks they know our script. So they don't want to talk to us because they know our lines and their lines. You, you get the feel for that? Yeah. They, know, they, they think they know what we're going to say. Right? So why do they need to involve us? You, I'm serious. Do you understand where I'm coming from on that? Right? So what starts happening here in this relationship is uh, I can model this for us. I can model this for us. Okay? Uh, how many of you are from uh, the Southern California area? Because this will help a little bit. Uh, let me do this differently. Southern California, Texas, Arizona, that range in there. Raise your hand. Okay. Where on the planet is immigration a bigger tangible issue? 
Yeah, Texas, Arizona, right, right, New Mexico, California. How many, how many of you can feel, feel this, uh, that conversation, right? Okay. So someone comes uh, to the U.S. in an unauthorized way and they're undocumented. So how many of you have met or probably met someone in that situation? Okay. All right. So you interact with them. That normally isn't what they lead with when they introduce themselves. <laughs> right? So you might not know that that's who you're talking to, right? But what you know is, wouldn't it be incredible if they didn't know our older brother yet? So, you know, you get into the conversation, something comes up one way or the other, you know, about your love for the Lord or whatever, you know, it comes up. And they get a little nervous because what are they imagining? Just the story. They know the script, right? So they might be slow to engage us, but not you because you've been loved so well by God, you're going to keep pressing, right? So you get into the conversation and it motors along a little bit. And eventually you notice that there is a line being drawn about a part of the conversation. And every time you kind of enter it, they step away. And that's where you figure out, oh, ah, OK, maybe. Right. So it finally comes out that they're here. What's our word nationally? Illegally. Now, where do they imagine this thing's going to go? Right. Because what's they know the script. Right. So. They say something like, I know this really bothers everybody and I know you probably don't want me here. And, I, you know, and you say something like, hey, you know, you got time for a cup of coffee. Here's something I've wondered. Could you tell me what it's like to grow up somewhere where all you can think about day after day is a way to get your family in a better place, even if it could cost you your freedom? And someone says, we, we've never seen anything like this. So you go to a restaurant and there's CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or something, you know, is on the television. So the script is running in the background. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying the script is running, right? But what's happening at the table? Right there is happening at the table, right? So, okay, you, do you get the feel for what I'm kind of leaning into here? So let's take another one, all right? Because this one I think might even be closer to home. Someone shows up at your church, uh, and it's a dad, and he's there with his two little kids, but like about the third week, you notice that there isn't a wife that shows up. Any of you? Right. Right. So then what are some questions? Well, you know, did you move here? Is one of you trying to, you know, kind of tie up things at home? Maybe you're selling a house. One of you got a job. One of you didn't. Right. Don't you wonder these things? Is it just me? OK, so there's three of us. <laughs> OK, so, but you know what I mean? Well, you know what they're kind of uh, steadying themselves for. Right. The next part of the question that, hey, you know, you know, where's your wife? And then what's going to happen? The right. What's going to happen is the script. And what do they think they know? They think they already know your lines. So what are they imagining? I got to avoid this conversation. But what if you say something like, hey, what do you guys got planned, planned after worship today? Is there any way we could go to lunch together? Can we do that? Can we go to lunch together? And then what are they still imagining? Oh, boy, I don't want to go through this all over again. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, you get to lunch and you just say, hey, you know, if you are comfortable Sharing a little bit about your background, fine. But if you're not, I would love to hear about your boys. And tell me the things you love the most about being a daddy. And what do you walk away with? Ah, that was different. Yeah. Never seen 
anything like this. What about when someone's child or grandchild kills themselves? What about that? And someone doesn't know the circumstances. They just know you've had a death in the family and it's a funeral. And yeah, it's awful. What does that mean? Please don't ask any more questions. But what if we said to them, would you like to be able to spend dinner with someone where you could talk about it or not? Where you don't have to really explain it all. And if you think that your loved one went to heaven even though they took their life, or you're struggling with where they ended up, I'm not going to feel like that somehow by the end of our dinner that I've got to heal you of that. Now, what have I talked about so far in the three circumstances? I've talked about one outside the church and two inside. Here is my question for us. Is there any difference other than the presence of the older brother? How many of you have noticed that statistically people in the church struggle about like people in the world? But the older brother really makes a difference. He really changes things. Doesn't he? So see, if we're focused on the church, then we might be worried about this and this and this. But if we're focused on Jesus, we might think to ourselves, ah, here's another opportunity. People digging through the ceiling. Wow. Now there's some faith. Rather than trying to figure out how to fix the ceiling. But you see, if I'm focused on the church, then I'm going to think, how do I fix the ceiling? If I'm focused on Jesus, like, wow, boy, there's some faith. You know, there might be enough faith there for a guy to get healed. Right? So someone's in our assembly. I'm thinking about a lady. She left the care of her kids when her oldest son was six. Nearly impossible to find her. In and out of jails. All the time. She just, it was just all a part of her life, all a part of her system. Prostitution, jail, drugs, and all that kind of stuff. It's as much a part of her system as anything's a part of your system. You know how to get to the grocery store and put your kids in Little League. She knew how to get bail, get out of jail, get in, get out. How to handle that. It's part of her system, part of your system. But her son grew up. And eventually, a day came when he got married. The family worked real hard. The adoptive family worked real hard to get her there for the wedding. We knew it would mean a lot to her estranged son. But the time came for the wedding to start. She was supposed to be there two hours in advance, didn't show up. Five minutes before the wedding was to begin, young man got a phone call. I was officiating the wedding. Young man got a phone call. They were just leaving the house. I could see all over his face the question of, why can't you love me just once really well? So I got into his line of vision, and I said, everybody sitting in that auditorium loves you. We'll wait. Everybody loves you. We'll wait. So I went into the auditorium, a group of people gathered, I said, hey, get to know each other. Talk amongst yourselves. Share a favorite wedding story. <laughs> We're waiting on a family member. When they get here, we'll do the wedding. So everybody kind of stared around a little bit. All right, you know, and they got involved with each other. She came to the door, and I watched the adopted mother who'd given her life to raising this young man go over to the estranged mother, wrap her arms around her, welcome her, put her arm around her, 
and say, you're sitting with me, and walked her down the aisle. And many people said, we've never seen anything like it. I wonder how much courage it takes to be the mom that's the prostitute and the drug addict and the in jail and out to show up in the lobby of a church to be the one that everyone despises. I wonder how much courage that takes to even get out of bed that morning, let alone show up in that church lobby. That's like digging a hole in the ceiling. Thank God. For the people there who were ready to focus on the older brother and not the disease. I want to back up to this statement right here in 12b in this verse. In the original language, I want you to make a note because this is an important piece here and I don't want to miss it. I accidentally stepped beyond it and I don't want to miss it. Okay, the word amazed here in our original language, which, you know, is this Koine Greek we're working with for those few centuries. This word amazed, uh, you, many of you have a capacity to do your own linguistic work. Look this up. It literally means to change place. That something happens in my life that moves me over at least one seat. It, it moved me. And that's why the people walk away and say, we've never seen anything like it. It doesn't just mean, huh, that was good. It means, I'm not sure I'll ever be the same after this. I don't think I'll ever be able to forget this. I'll probably act differently from now on. It's probably what's going to happen to me. Now you realize, if I go to church every single week for a really long time, I might think I know the script. How many of you have ever gone to lunch and said, honey, who led the closing prayer today? And then with a sheepish moment, <clears throat> I did, dear. Oh, sorry, I, my mind was somewhere else. <laughs> or, or do we have some worship leaders in here? How come we never sing such and such a song? And somebody said, yeah, we actually sang that last week. <laughs> oh, and I was there. Do you get to where you know the script a little bit? You see how dangerous it is? Because, see, not only does the world think they don't need to engage us in the conversation, we don't think we need to engage each, engage each other. Because we already know the script. The reason we know the script is we're focused on churchianity. And if you focus on churchianity and you're around it long enough, you learn the script. How many of you were ever in drama presentations? How many of you ever learned somebody else's lines? <laughs> now do you get why I'm choosing this metaphor? If people think they know your lines, they don't need you. If people can get our religion off of cable news network, we're focused on the disease, not our elder brother. If they can listen to politics and know the script of the church, we have enmeshed the disease with the cure. So see, the best possible thing that could happen is that we'd come to the end. Not just the end of this message, but the end of churchianity. And wouldn't it be something if in our communities people were knocked out of their place because they've never seen anything like this. I couldn't help but notice this, and I'll just back up to this piece, that the word SALT showed up in my little acronym. I, I'll be honest with you, those of you that are preachers know, I didn't notice that at first, it just came a little later on down the road. I was really glad it jumped out at me, that being the salt of the earth might be what causes people to say we've never seen anything like this. All right. Well, we'll do a little bit more tomorrow and the next day. Thanks for coming today. God bless you.